These are America's top outdoor retailers. And they've come all the way to Queenstown to trample over what Icebreaker calls its factory. And this is Jeremy Moon, Mr. Icebreaker. So Jeremy, this is your factory. Yeah, this is our fibre factory. You can see the Remarkables in the far corner there. And uh, Stewart Island's about 200k that way. Get the camera guy here. <laughs> These Americans have been brought to the mountain because icebreaker garments are one of the hottest things going in outdoor clothing. You want me to do one more? Just in case. <laughs> Retailers like J. Michael Brown from Colorado want a bigger slice of the action. Not bragging, but we get calls from Hollywood now ask because we have one of the best selections of icebreaker in the U.S. Well, you know stuff. what I'm going to ask you now. Yeah, who? <laughs> <laughs> I can't say. I'd lose their... <laughs> no. Can you give but, us a hint? Uh, it's, you know, it's producers, directors, some actors, you know. And the icebreaker recipe. The old Kiwi innovation and the new. Stylish, modern design design mixed with a big dollop of marketing genius and straight off the back of the animal that built this country outnumbers us four to one and continues to be the butt of countless jokes at our expense the humble sheep is wool friend no wool's our enemy so this isn't about bringing back wool wool is uh, useless for clothing um, long live merino so it's about building this new idea, which is really distinct from the old-fashioned stuff. I've got wool carpets at home, fantastic, but not against the skin. He's talking about the coarse stuff, not the mighty Merino's super-fine fibre. Icebreaker took it and spun, knitted and weaved it into one of our great business success stories of the past decade. The company's just had its 10th birthday, employs people all over the world, and is a far cry from the one-man business Jeremy Moon started in 1995. This year we'll have more than half a million customers globally. What's your turnover? Oh, tens of millions. Did you ever think you'd be at this point? Um, I kind of thought if we weren't at this point, then we'd failed. For many Kiwis, this is the heart and soul of New Zealand, the ruggedly beautiful high country. It's the way we like the rest of the world to see us. And it's also the birthplace of one of New Zealand's biggest fashion exports. The story of Icebreaker really began when Jeremy Moon was 24 years old. Fresh out of university, and armed with a marketing degree, a marine armor by the name of Brian Brackenridge showed him his underpants. I was at lunch and he threw me uh, these across the table Long and dogs. I didn't quite know what to expect, but when you touch them, they're wool, but they feel so beautifully soft like silk and you can throw them in the washing machine and suddenly here was a new idea. Everything in the market, in the outdoor market, was made of plastic. So I thought, if we could crack this, we're onto something big. Remember, Jeremy was just a lamb in business terms, but he was determined to make it. So he mortgaged his house. So the whole range fitted in my grandfather's suitcase. Bought half of Brian's company and set off with a battered old suitcase, peddling his wares. So Peter Blake took a pair of icebreaker underpants on the ultimate road test, the sea. He wore the same pair of long johns for 43 days and 43 nights in the Jules Verne challenge. Sir Peter swears they never smelt and he was still smiling by the end of the race. It was incredibly generous of him because here I was, someone with no credibility in an industry I didn't know or understand, with an unproven product that no one had heard of and no one knew what Merino wool was. So, and here Peter came out saying he didn't take it off for 43 days and it's the best thing he's ever worn. So. Without that critical ingredient, it would have been almost impossible. Robin and Linda Butson are the owners of Mount Nicholas Station on the shores of Lake Wakatipu. They were among the first suppliers of merino fibre to Icebreaker. He tested for strength, diameter, 
They're true believers now, but had to be convinced at the start. Do you remember the first time you met Jeremy? Yep. Looked a bit dreamy with his battered old suitcase and a bit of a talk to him and he was pretty, pretty hooked on this merino fibre. So, um, when we got home from the conference, Linda said, what are you thinking? And I said, yeah. I just figured him, I think, I don't think he's much used to us. He probably a bit of a, looked a bit of a dreamer to me. She's a hard road building the perfect business boy and the early days at Icebreaker were tough. The whole thing nearly went belly up in the first year. I got a, a, a letter actually from uh, one of the best growers um, uh, in South Island and uh, she said, we're working so hard to grow, to cr to grow and, and create a great product and I just bought one of your tops and it's falling apart. What are you gonna do about it? And I was devastated and the reason was because, was because we were buying yarn which was pure New Zealand Merino, but we didn't know where it came from. He needed quality control. So Jeremy took another punt. He signed farmers to contracts to grow Merino fibre just for Icebreaker. They would be paid an agreed price for an agreed quality. It's a bit like uh, wine. Just because it's from Bordeaux doesn't mean it's great. You can have Shadow Petrus at 1500 a bottle and also you can have Shadow Riot and get changed from 350. The first contract in 1997 was just 700 kilograms. Four bales of wool delivered on the back of a ute. Icebreaker now controls more than a quarter of New Zealand's fine merino clip. We've just signed contracts uh, 2006, 7 and 8. So that's about two and a half thousand tonnes, roughly, of pure merino. So that's quite a big chunk of the clip. Um, yeah, worth about $30 million. In fact, it's the largest merino contract in the world. And for many, it has economically rescued the high country. For stations like this, he's been a saviour to us. He's, uh, really? A saviour? Yeah, I think uh, in these times, the contracts that keep a station like this viable. Just how t tough is it now? for merino farmers. If you take the contracts out of the system, it's probably as bad as it's ever been. Really? I think in real terms, uh, merino wool's as low as it's ever been. But this company is not about the manufacturing, it's all about the marketing. They had the brand before they had the product. It all comes down to how you spin it. Remember Shrek, the daggy old merino wandering about in the bush who literally became world famous in New Zealand. When Jeremy heard the yarn, he thought, bingo. <laughs> um, Michelle, our marketing manager, said um, he needs a jacket. And we had about 12 hours to build him one. After this footage of the recently shorn Shrek wearing an icebreaker jacket went global, the website went ballistic. So we got a jacket on him and um, Littleicebreaker.com earned us a million hits the next day. A million globally. hits? Yeah. We started getting emails from front pages in Switzerland and the US and all through Europe of when Shrek um, became a, a, a global hero. These Americans know all about Icebreaker, but they know nothing about where the raw material comes from. We keep our flock young here. What, what happened to the one that we passed on the way up, do you think? Died. <laughs> <laughs> And just down the road from Mount Nicholas is Nokamai Station, which has more merino than any other station in New Zealand. It's huge, covers about 38,000 hectares, an area twice the size of Auckland City, and produces about 20 tonnes of pure merino fibre every year. But when you bring people here, it moves from being an idea to a feeling. It gets deep under their skin and they become very passionate advocates both of Icebreaker and of New Zealand. And these people are the key to Icebreaker cracking the huge American market. They're not from the big cities, but the resort towns. Icebreaker's still only sold at outdoor stores by people like Jeff Weedman from Wisconsin. So what do you think of our national roading system here? <laughs> I think it needs some improvement. <laughs> Jeff owns the largest canoe and kayak shop in the United States. 
How big do you think Icebreaker can be in the United States? Ah, that's a really good question. Um, my, my guess would be 75 to 100 million in U.S. dollars at wholesale. What we find is, and this is exactly what Jeremy told us, is people buy a piece and then they tell their friends and then their friends come in. Uh, recently, uh, we had a telephone order for $1,000 from one customer who bought a t-shirt, loved it, and then all of a sudden it's like Christmas gifts for everyone. So, <laughs> so you're saying it's basically got a cult status. It's viral. What, what fascinates me is, is he designed the brand before he designed the product. It's completely backwards. I mean, from anybody that's classically trained in business, it's, it's a train wreck. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, it's just not normal. I mean, he could be growing his business in the States so much faster. He, he recently turned down uh, a huge customer. We've turned down some pretty big chains in the U.S., not because we don't want to do business with them, but because we want to do it when the time's right and when the strategy's been built. The worst thing you can do is try and scale a brand too quickly and uh, either not be ready for it and disappoint people or burn the people who are the core partners. So we try and get things right place, right time. The marketing says high country, but the gear is more often worn in the high street. It's the sort of clothing equivalent of the SUV only without the pollution. Icebreaker doesn't want to be a fashion flash in the pan. Here today, gone tomorrow. This is a company with a 100 year vision which will far outlive the natural life of its youthful founder. When we moved in here there were about uh, 20 people and in our Wellington office here we've got about 50 now. When you first started, one of the Merino farmers said you were a bit of a dreamer. Do you think you're a dreamer? Um, oh. You've got to be a bit of a dreamer, but um, it's a, probably a balance between having some dreams and breaking it into little things that we can have a crack at.